All right, hello everyone. Welcome to, I think it's week four. Um, this week we are reading The Scarlet Letter. I um, hope you guys are excited. Uh, this is a really fun book. Um, this is going to be, the language in this book is going to be a little bit more difficult than the previous books, or actually probably any of the books that we're going to read this term. Um, but I think you're really going to enjoy it. And uh, I imagine a lot of you have read it already in high school or when you were younger. And may didn't have and probably didn't enjoy it as much then. Um, well, I had a same similar experience. Um, so I read it in high school, didn't care for it too much. Um, I came back and read it later, um, probably about uh, eight years later. And really, it's I'm a completely different person now than I was then. And it's uh, just the book is just so much better. At um, once you once you go back and read it. You need to have so much of a different perspective than you had when you were in high school. So I think for a lot of you, I imagine you'll have a similar experience. Um, so what I'm going to do today is just going to go over a quick lecture um, for the book. And then after that, just get you caught up and up to speed, um, like I've been doing every week, on um, what's going on on a blackboard, what you need to be doing. And then, um, yeah, that, that's, that's all we're going to do for today. I'll try to keep it short. Um, and let's get started. So let's go here. Wanna... All right. Oh, let me switch screens. There we go. Cool. Um, so the book that we're reading, like I said, Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And um, as you guys can see, um, Hawthorne was born in 1804, Salem, Massachusetts. Um, and he's actually a descendant of John Hawthorne, who's one of the judges um, for the trial during the Salem witch trials. Um, and because of his background and his heritage, Hawthorne, uh, if you'll notice, he actually added a W to his name to kind of differentiate himself uh, from his grandpa. Um, he wrote the Scarlet Letter in 1850, um, or his completed writing it in 1850. It actually, only took him about a year to write. He started in 1849. Um, and then finish the book pretty quick. Uh, there's a lot of symbolism in this story. I mean, it just starts off right off the bat um, when you have the, you know, it talks about the, the rose right outside the prison door. Um, and then uh, this book, like Frankenstein, was also written during the Romantic Movement. Um, and you'll notice as you're reading it, uh, lots of intense emotions that are being felt by the different, um, different characters. And there's a big emphasis on nature and, and a couple, and there's actually a couple big scenes that happen in, in, in the woods that I think you'll, you'll find that are, that are very key to the story uh, or enjoyable to read. So he wrote this, um, it, this, this story is actually kind of a historical fiction. So he even wrote it previously to when he, um, so the book was written in 1850, but the setting takes place in the 1640s. Uh, and 1640s Boston based on a Puritan settlement. And um, so Boston was founded by roughly a uh, thousand Puritans and their leader was John Winthrop. And kind of ironically, they left England for uh, religious freedom, yet when they moved here, they weren't really tolerant of other religions um, or other uh, types of influences. It's kind of interesting. Um, and in this society, they were very strict um, and very vigilant of one another. Um, and they, they, so they all kept a close watch. Everyone is, was part of everyone's business. Um, and this, it was this idea of seeking this, um, almost this, this utopian society is kind of what they had in mind. Um, but whenever people are involved, um, it's, it's never going to be perfect. Um, we will continue to make the same mistakes we've been making for thousands of years. Um, it just may look a little different. Um, so, um, in the Puritan history, um, they were very harsh on sin. Um, and, I mean, they would, you could be punished for things as simple as being, dressing too exotically um, and not being modest. Um, and... For Hester, um, as you guys will read this book, her punishment is actually pretty mild. Um, typically, um, when a person committed adultery in the Puritan society, they were they were fined and then had a public whipping. Um, and then, as Hester, um, as you'll read in this in this story, 
um, they had they'll have to wear the 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 letters signifying their their sin. And if you're a man, you're forced to pay child support. Um, so within Hawthorne stories. Evil is a, is a very common theme. Uh, and if you get a chance, I highly recommend uh, reading some of his short stories. Um, they're just really good. Um, so The Minister in His Black Veil, um, Dr. Heidegger's Experiment. Um, they're, they're, they're short, sweet, just great stories. If we had more time in this course, um, I would love to incorporate those. Um, and But... In this story, I'm curious, as you guys are reading it, these are th some things to think about and maybe take notes on, is this idea of evil and his perception of it and how he portrays it, and if you think it's actually accurate. Uh, so, you know, is this evil with us from birth, or is it kind of created as we grow? Um, do, I mean, are we, is Hester alone in these struggles? I, I imagine not, but um, what does that look like today? Um, are is there the same type of punishment or shame that is associated with, um, you know, these choices that people make, I guess. Um, and this idea of maybe we are all capable of making this, uh, of doing these bad things, um, yet we just may not have been put in these bad situations. Um, so, and he does address a lot of these questions in the story. And I'm curious to, you know, as you are reading it, um, yeah, write, write your notes on it and share in the discussion board. I, I'm always, you can always post more than what I ask you to post. Um, and this idea of private sin and how it can really, uh, really hurt a person and, and, and tear somebody up. So the story begins with the custom house. I think that's the first chapter. And it's about a man who discovers these old records. And he finds him in this attic, and he pieces together the story of Hester Prynne. Um, it's kind of weird, and does it, it's kind of clunky to me when I'm reading it. Um, it is not essential to the story. Um, you do not have to read this part of the, of the novel if you don't want to. Uh, if you want to read it, great, more power to you. Um, but I'm not going to make you read this. So this should save you a little bit of time. Um, so in this story, uh, Hawthorne does a lot of cool things. Um, and uh, so this idea of you can't flee who you are. Um, oh, and here's where the spoilers happen. So if you haven't read the book and you're watching this video, it's probably a good time to turn it off. Um, so, okay, good, you got All right, so if you are, um, so what the author does in this story, he does a lot of cool things. Um, so you can't flee from your sin. Um, Hester and Arthur um, at one point are, are going to run away. They're going to run away. They're going to leave everything behind. Um, and then, lo and behold, Chillingsworth is waiting for him on the boat. He's not going to let him go. So this idea of, you know, we, we have to confront our own sin. Um, we have to confront the things because it's just going to follow us everywhere. Uh, I thought that was a really interesting um, thing that Hawthorne did in this story. Um, as And as you're reading it, uh, I, I met I, I encourage you to look out for that. See how he, what his thoughts are on um, how we should deal with uh, maybe some of the things that we're not too proud of or ashamed of. Um, the sin of the will versus the sin of the flesh. I think it's rather obvious um, Hawthorne's view on this. Um, so we have Hester and Arthur, um, who they they do the sin of the flesh, it's the sin of passion in, in this moment, and yet it doesn't. You'll, I believe, um, as you're reading this story, this sin does not weigh as heavily, um, doesn't appear to be as evil as when comparing it to Chillingworth, um, who is intent on just doing evil and harming um, Arthur. Um, another thing that uh, Hawthorne uses in this story is this power of guilt, and that and that's going to be portrayed through Arthur. Arthur um, and this, I, and kind of going back to this romantic uh, period, the, that nature is is this freedom, it's this haven for people to escape and be free. Um, yet, uh, this society, this Puritan society, sees it as a bad thing. Uh, so there's these con conflicting views in the story um, that are really fun to look at. As you know, you have people that enjoy going out there, yet a lot of society sees this nature um, and this lack of control as as evil and scary and 
you know, that's where the witches are, and um, it, it, it's unique, and, and I think um, it, it makes, it just, it can, this story is just so rich and filled with a lot of interesting um, ideas, and I, I just think it's, it's just very well written. Um, another thing that um, he does in this story is the name of the daughter that Hester has is Pearl. Um, and it's actually, and he makes, he tells you in the story why he named her that. And there's a reference to uh, one of the quotes in, in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, and it's Pearl at, at a great price, purchased with all she had, her mother's only treasure. Um, and, and again, this reference refers to the, the Pearl of Great Price um, in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, just to kind of represent that, what it costed Hester, Hester to have this child. Um, and then the A has lots of different symbolism, and even um, Hawthorne gives you um, answers um, as you're reading it. Um, but the one that I don't think he gives you is, is uh, and it's a lot more subtle than the other ones, but I, I think a lot of what the A stands for on, on, the, on Hester's chest um, is Arthur. And it is interesting because as, you know, when they're asking her, you know, who's the father, and she holds the, you know, it's like she's right there. She's holding the A right, right on her chest. Um, and, and then you'll also notice that Arthur has the, it, well, you don't know. Some say, some say it is, some say it's not there, the A that's also on his own chest. Um, I like to think that it is there. Um, but again, that's up to your interpretation. Um, so um, that's it for this uh, quick little lecture. Um, let me close out of this. Um, so coming up, don't forget your thesis is due December 17th. That is this week. Um, do not forget to do that. Um, turn it in, um, and then I'll give you my blessing to let you know, you know, this is going to work. Um, and a lot, a lot of what I'm going to do is, is just helping you. I'm, I'm helping you so you can write a better paper. It's going to be, it's going to be easier for you to research it. That's, that's what I'm trying to do here. Um, and speaking of your research papers, so you should start uh, looking for sources now. And to do that, um, I recommend you just come over here to the Wayland Library button. And the great thing about our Wayland Library, it's just filled with great stuff. So you can do simple searches in here if you want. Um, one database I will recommend in this video is using um, JSTOR. So if you go to all databases and let's just do control F, um, go down to JSTOR. All right, so let's say you're, you're going to write a uh, some, something on Mary Shelley and Frankenstein. I'm not, I'm not sure what what your topic would be, but this may be a good place to start. Maybe you, you're not even sure what your thesis is going to be. Um, and a good way to maybe determine one is starting by looking at the articles and seeing what's out there already. Um, and that may that may help you. Um, even within, so I do recommend within your own books, you can look at the, the commentaries. Some of you may have bought a Frankenstein that has some resources in it already. Maybe it, it would be good, wise to read, read those. Um, the one that I have that I recommend um, is the um, Ignatius Critical Editions. Um, it's, it's, it has a lot of good stuff in here. And to me, it makes a lot more sense than some of these. Um, you'll read some in, very interesting interpretations um, of, of the story and what some of the symbolism may be. Um, but you can come in here and just kind of see, you know, different articles that are out there. Um, so, again, JSTOR is a great source for writing your papers. You only need, I can't remember how many I said, like maybe it's like two additional sources on top of using the book. Um, let me, let's review that real quick. So if you just go to the syllabus, um, all the instructions for writing your paper are right here. Um, Yeah, so there's two secondary scholarly sources. So you can use commentaries from your books. Um, other, you can use other, you know, commentaries from other books, um, essays. You can use the JSTOR. Um, any any other resource out there, feel free to use it. And then please uh, either work in MLA or APA formatting. 
and then um, that's how I'll grade you. You can kind of see how that's going to work. Um, this is a big part of your grade, so take it seriously. That's 20%. So if you don't do this, the best you can do is 80%. And that means you got 100% on everything else. So um, again, take this project seriously. Take your time. Follow the steps. You're going to need to use, don't forget to set up your Writing Center account. Um, and then your, your final product will be due on February 8th. Um, so um, way to go so far, everyone. I really have been enjoying your guys' comments and responses on the discussion board. Your tests have been fun to, fun to grade. I always like to see your guys' views on things. Um, if you have any questions, just never have to hesitate to contact me. Um, my email is jeff.ebbing at wayland.wbu.edu. Um, I'm here to help. So have a great day. Um, enjoy the Scarlet Letter. It's a great book. And I will talk to you soon. Oops.